A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, for Jew first and then Greek, for in it is revealed the righteousness of God from faith to faith. As it is written, the one who is righteous by faith will live. The wrath of God is indeed being revealed from heaven against every impiety and wickedness of those who suppress the truth by their wickedness. For what can be known about God is evident to them because God made it evident to them ever since the creation of the world. His invisible attributes of eternal power and divinity have been able to be understood and perceived in what he has made. As a result, they have no excuse, for although they knew God, they did not accord with him glory as God or give him thanks. Instead, they became vain in their reasoning, and their senseless minds were darkened. While claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for the likeness of an image of mortal man, or of birds, or of four-legged animals, or of snakes. Therefore, God handed them over to impurity through the lust of their hearts, for the mutual degradation of their bodies. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and revered and worshipped the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Verbum Domini. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day pours out the word to day, and night to night imparts knowledge. Not a word nor a discourse whose voice is not heard. Through all the earth their voice resounds, and to the ends of the world their message. Dominus vobiscum, et consilium tuo, Lectio Sancti Evangelii secundum Lucam, Gloria Sibi et Domine. After Jesus had spoken, a Pharisee invited him to dine at his home. He entered and reclined at table to eat. The Pharisee was amazed to see that he did not observe the prescribed washing before the meal. The Lord said to him, O you Pharisees, although you cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish, inside you are filled with plunder and evil, you fools. Did, Did not the maker of the outside also make the inside? But as to what is within, give alms and behold, everything will be clean for you. Verbum Domini.
First of all, the letter to the Romans from St. Paul perfectly really summarizes St. Paul's life, his identity, and should summarize the identity of every Christian, especially the saint that we celebrate today, St. Ignatius of Antioch. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Every Christian should be able to say that, not just with their lips, but from their heart, as the gospel says. It's not just about the outside, the appearance, but what flows from within. It's not just about the outside of the cup, but the inside of the cup. We should be not afraid of the gospel. Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI said of Ignatius of Antioch, he says, quote, no church father has expressed a longing for union with Christ and for life in him with the intensity of Ignatius. In his letters, the Pope Emeritus said, one feels the freshness of faith of the generation which still had known the apostles. In these letters, the ardent love of a saint can be felt. St. Ignatius was somebody from the early church, a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of St. John. So we're still in the post-apostolic age. And we have to imagine that this age was very fervent in their Christianity, very fervent in their practices. The Acts of the Apostles say that it was at Antioch where they were first known as what? Christians. They were first known as Christians in Antioch. This is so important. St. Ignatius was born in Syria in the middle of the first century AD and is said to have been personally instructed again by the future martyr, St. Polycarp, who was instructed by St. John. St. John was instructed by the Lord himself. When we confess that the faith is one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic, our faith is built upon the faith of those who had professed their faith in the one who laid down his life, Jesus Christ. So it's built upon human persons who have professed their faith, going all the way back to the Son of God, going all the way back to the one who shed his blood. St. Ignatius became the Bishop of Antioch around the year 70, and he assumed leadership of that local church in Antioch which according to tradition was first led by St. Peter before he would go to Rome to be the Bishop of Rome. The seven letters that, wrote, that he wrote emphasized the importance of church unity as well as a hierarchical structure. When you read his writings, he speaks of the Bishop, he speaks of the hierarchy and being obedient to the hierarchy of the church. And he also speaks about the dangers of heresy. And most of all, about the Holy Eucharist as the medicine of immortality, he calls it. The medicine of immortality. His writings contain the first early witness of the church as Catholic. In his writings, he would emphasize that word as Catholic, meaning from the Greek, fullness or universality, a faith that is taught everywhere. All throughout the early church, this was something that was so important to the early church fathers in determining what was part of the deposit of the faith. They knew this because that it was taught by the apostles, by their successors, and all throughout the regions that were Christian. 
he used the word Catholic first. St. Ignatius, in his life, strove after union with Christ above all else. And this was shown most of all in his martyrdom, in his shedding of his blood. He said, I am writing to all the churches to let it be known that I will gladly die for God if only you do not stand in my way. People were trying to say no, just like they did Jesus. No, you can't go to the cross. This is how we, we don't know you as a suffering Messiah. I plead with you, he says, show me no untimely kindness. Show me, let me be the food for the wild beasts. He would prophesy his own death. For they are my way to God. I am God's wheat and shall be ground by their teeth so that I may become Christ's pure bread. Pray to Christ for me that the animals will be the means of making me a sacrificial victim to God. All the pleasures of the world and the kingdoms of the earth shall profit me nothing, he wrote to the Church of Rome. It is better for me to die on behalf of Christ than to reign over all the ends of the earth. He says further, now I begin to be a disciple. Now I begin to be a disciple by having this type of mindset. Again, as St. Paul says, not to be ashamed of the gospel. Let fire and the cross, he says, let the crowds of wild beasts, let tearings, breakings, and dislocations of bones, let cutting off of members, let shatterings of the whole body, let, the, let all the dreadful torments of the devil come upon me, only let me attain to Jesus Christ. It's pretty graphic. It's a pretty graphic description of somebody who was in love with Christ. All throughout the month of October, we have examples of saints who really teach us about the love of Christ. Yesterday was St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, and the Lord Jesus himself would appear to her in the 1600s and teach her about his love that his heart was literally burning on fire. His heart was like a holocaust. Why? Because, probably because at that time, many people had forgotten the love and the mercy of Christ. There was such a focus on the justice of God and a, and a forgetting of his love and his mercy. And the Lord had to come once again and to remind people through St. Margaret Mary Alacoque of his immense love, that his heart burns on, in love for us. And St. Ignatius, by his martyrdom, martyrdom really is the supreme act of love that we can give for God. There is no other act of love that we can give as Christians more greater than the shedding of our blood. But also as Christians, we experience not only red martyrdom, but the dying to ourselves every day, which sometimes is a slower death. It's a more painful death as some church theologians would write such as St. Bernard of Clairvaux would say that the white martyrdom is even sometimes more painful. Red martyrdom is a grace, it comes at a moment, but the white martyrdom that we experience as Christians, we take every single day and it can go even until our death. The daily dying to ourselves. 
In the gospel, the Lord Jesus teaches us about what it means to have this interior disposition. Not just about the cleaning of the outside of the cup again, but the cleaning of the inside, the interior. That which flows from the outside are actions, are words that come out of our mouth, really start inside. They start deep down within us. And that's where holiness begins. Holiness begins from the inside out. St. Augustine comments on the gospel passage, but as to what is within, give alms, and behold, everything will be clean for you. He comments that this applies to all useful acts of mercy. It does not apply just to the one who gives food to the hungry, drink to the thirsty, clothing to the naked, hospitality to the wayfarer, or refuge to the fugitive. Most of all, when we think of alms, we think of giving away, perhaps clothing, some of our money that we don't need or even of our surplus. But when we give alms, it shouldn't really just be from our surplus, but it really should make us kind of wince. Like, deep down, we know that we're trying to hold on to this for something. But when we give alms, it should make us hurt a little bit. We should give from that which we think we're holding on to. He says it also applies, St. Augustine, this is St. Augustine, it also applies to one who visits the sick and the prisoner, redeems the captive, bears the burdens of the weak, leads the blind, comforts the sorrowful, heals the sick, showing, erring the way. Share, basically showing those who are straying from the faith, showing them and pointing them back to the way. This is something St. Ignatius of Antioch did in his pointing those back that were straying, those that were falling into false ways of teaching who Jesus Christ was. And this is hard. This is not easy calmly and with charity and with truth, pointing those back to the truth. He says, giving advice to the perplexed and does whatever is needy for the needy. Not only does this person give alms, but the person who forgives the trespasser also gives alms as well. So forgiveness is a way of giving alms thought that was a neat way of looking at it. When we forgive, we give alms to God, not just to the person we forgive, but this is pleasing most of all to God when we forgive. Those people in our lives that is most difficult to forgive, perhaps our family members, those closest to us that have hurt us throughout our lives. People in our lives that have hurt us perhaps at a young age, and we're still holding on to that, to let go and to forgive. This is pleasing to God. These are alms. These are ways of dying to ourself. This is martyrdom, white martyrdom. Not just red martyrdom, but white martyrdom, a way of denying ourselves. He says, at the same time, he forgives from the heart the sin by which he has wronged or offended or prays that it be forgiven by the offender. St. Augustine says, such a person gives alms not only because he forgives and prays, but also because he rebukes and administers corrective punishment 
since this is how he shows mercy. Again, he says there are many ways of giving alms. I think we just went through all the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. And just in that short time, feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, shelter the homeless, visit the sick, visit the imprisoned, bury the dead. In the spiritual works of mercy, admonish the sinner, instruct the ignorant, counsel the doubtful, comfort the sorrowful, bear wrongs patiently, forgive all injuries, pray for the living and the dead. Most of all, all of this begins not just with our exterior actions. What St. Ignatius of Antioch, his martyrdom just was not, was not just an exterior action, but it's something that first began within him. That first began within him a dying of self to the heart and this striving after Christ above all things. This not being afraid, not being ashamed of the gospel. That's where it begins, right here inside our own hearts, this transformation of the heart. Once our hearts are transformed, then that's going to transform the way we give to others. That's going to change the way we speak to others. Maybe our mouths may not be quite as dirty as they are now. But when our hearts are transformed, when we're transformed interiorly, everything else from the outside flows from this interior transformation. <laughs>